The devil is a professional Jesus loser. Is the you are anointed to win. Jesus is the Welcome to the Walk the Devil podcast. Jesus is Here's the your host, Corey Scarlett. Jesus is Welcome to the Whoop the Devil podcast. Here we are. We're going to have a good day. We're going to finish up 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. That's what we're starting with. Follow, share, all that in here. I'm drinking out my, my Karen's Cafe mug. Okay. Any One Tree Hill fans out there? I'm definitely not. Um, that's my wife's coffee cup. And it's even chipped. But, you know, we got to keep it because, you know. So, anyways. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, share this. If you're up, you know people that are up on Saturday morning. If you know people that are still in, if you're still in bed right now, ho- hopefully there's a good reason. Um, but, you know, I get it. It's Saturday. So, share this. We're going to talk about First Peter 5. Um we're going to finish up. And then just a heads up, I'm going to do this every day. I'm not going to do it on Sundays. Uh, I might do it on Saturday sometimes, sometimes not. We'll see. Um, I, I got behind a little bit because I started on, uh, I didn't start on New Year's Day. I started on the day after. So I had calculated the amount of chapters in James, First and Second Peter, and first, second, third John, and we could do a chapter a day and finish by the end of the month. And we would have done a chapter a day from the people that were closest to Jesus. Well, actually, that's a different James. I just realized it's a totally different James. Okay, uh, that's Jesus' brother, not James the disciple. But, you know, it sounds good. So I'll do Peter, and we'll do first, second, third John. And we might do a few of the other smaller books, too. But, um, yeah, so... I'm not going to address it, address it right now, but I did get a comment randomly on YouTube and I don't have a lot of people watching us on YouTube for whatever reason we don't, but there is the YouTube channel. If you have a YouTube channel, listen, okay, let me explain. If you watch YouTube, that means you have a YouTube account. 90, most likely you signed up for a YouTube account. Like, I mean, I know there's a way to watch it without an account, but most people have an account on YouTube. So if you would do me the favor and subscribe on YouTube so we can get that subscriber count up. Basically, everything I post on here gets posted to YouTube. And I'm thinking about doing some videos just exclusively for YouTube or doing some edits of the other podcast and breaking them down and presenting them as like a teaching. You know, I did some really good stuff on um, alcohol. I did some really good stuff on uh, tongues breaking that down. So I think those videos need to be posted um, maybe in a different format because, you know, live videos show up differently on the feed than uh, just a posted video. So I'll probably do some edits on those. Also, there's YouTube shorts, which are essentially anything I post on TikTok or Instagram as reels, which I'll get back to doing that. My wife said, you need to get back to doing the, the reels. So I'll get back to doing the reels. And, um, We'll, we'll be posting them on there. So all these things you need to follow. Um, I will go live Monday at 8 p.m. And then um, that'll be the next live after this. And then I'll announce the schedule for the week if you want to watch all the way through as we'll start Second Peter. Because guess what? There's not just a First Peter. There's a Second Peter. And we're going to start it. So let's get right into the scripture here. New Living Translation. First Peter 5. Advice for elders and young men. All right. I want you to write in the comments, elders equal modern day pastors. Elders equal modern day pastors. All right. So you see elders in the church. That's just not talking about some old guy. And just because he's old, he gets to, he gets to boss you around. Okay. It's talking about the entrusted leadership of a church. Okay, now you don't see the word pastor really used in church. Uh, It translates uh, as, let's see, I'll give you the word here for elder. Presbyteros. So this could mean 
presbyters, bishops, pastors, and overseers of the churches. You see the word overseer in some translations. They may use pastor in some translation, but um, this is what that's talking about. So this is talking about pastor. So in the comments, right, elders equal modern day pastors. Elders equal modern day pastors. Um, you know, occasionally you'll see uh, a smart aleck on the internet say, or someone you know, say, "Well, the Bible doesn't even have pastors." Well, this is what this is where it has pastors. Okay, Jesus is my pastor. All right, that's awesome. You know, Jesus is is my my pastor too. But um, so is Pastor Chuck Pelham, right? So I mean, it's like you don't want accountability because. You don't want to, you think, let me, I'm going to go on a little rant. And I meant to talk about this yesterday because it talked about in the, in the previous chapter, um, it talked about how we are to serve with the gifts that we have. And um, there are many people that say, you know, I don't, I don't go to church. Um, I don't need to go to church. Church is in my heart. Jesus lives in my heart. Jesus is my pastor. All this jazz, right? And with the, the, the issue is they think church is just for them. But as we can see in 1 Peter 4, and it's going to tie right into this next chapter, um, fun fact, let me stop and give another rabbit trail. Chapters were not in the original letters, okay? They, the the um, people divided that up. Chapters and verses were not in there. They put them in there to help organize and find verses better, okay? So that wasn't, Peter didn't write five really big and then and skip the one because you know they always skip the one in, in Bibles, and then write two, three, all the way down for verses. And he didn't do paragraphs, really. I mean, they might have separated a little bit, but they didn't. They didn't have it like like we do now. But that is so we can find it as believers. We can get into church, or we can study, and we can say, all right, all right, okay, five, and then go down to seven. Okay, that's where I'm supposed to be. That's why that's in there. But anyways. These would go would have went right back to back to each other. So in in chapter four, it talks about how we are to serve one another with our different gifts. Uh, it lists some different things. If you're good at helping others, if you're good at speaking, um, to serve the body with that, the body of Christ, the people in the church, the other believers, and anybody, um, anybody really, any person, and also to serve God to bring glory to God. So you being in church is not just for you. It's for others as well. You are to serve others. So it's not just about what I can get. It's what can God get through me to other people? What can God get through me to others? So if you miss the serving part, write in the comments, it's not all about me. It's not all about me. So church is not, all, or you can put this more specifically, church is not all about me. Church is about mainly you do receive when you're in church, but it's what can God get through me to bless others? And you're still going to receive. I mean, most serve, you know, most people that serve in church, you, you get, you hear the message. The majority of people are still going to be able to hear the message. It's not like, you know, you're so busy, you can't hear the message. And if people do that, they're, do, you know, and I understand there are people that serve in like kids church and nursery and stuff, and you're still learning. I mean, good Lord, sometimes people. People need to go back through those basics and learn. If you've got to learn, if you've got to teach the kids, you've got to know that thing uh, inside and out, whatever lesson you're teaching. So you're learning just as much as somebody that was sitting in a sanctuary. It's just a little bit different. Now, however, there are um, people that will serve. I'm so busy serving every day, every Sunday that I can't sit in a service. And that's a problem. But I won't go down that rabbit <coughs> rabbit trail. So you got to, you, people purposely get busy to avoid the, to be in, in a service because they don't want to hear it. They just want to be busy bodies and that's not good. Anyways, let's get to the scripture. I hadn't even read one yet. Now a word to you who are elders in the churches. This is Peter talking. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world <clears throat> as a <clears throat> Whoa, as a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. So here's, look, 
here is a picture of a a man or a woman and I could I've done a whole thing on that. You can look it up. It's called gender roles in the Bible or what does the Bible say about gender? And I go through a thing about female pastors because this same word used for elders in church is used for females in uh, other New Testament scriptures. So people have a hard time with female preachers because of the scripture about staying silent in the church that is in, um, I believe, um, First or Second Timothy. People have a tr uh, trouble with that, and I get it. It's maybe it's a little unclear, but in context, I explained that really good uh, in that YouTube video. So you can look it up. I did it a while back. It has Barbies on it because I did it around Barbie time, just because I felt like it when that Barbie movie came out. What a time to be alive. Um, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. So what it's saying is there is an entrusted group of people to an overseer or an elder. All right. That he would care for them and, and, uh, teach them the word <coughs> and things like that. So it says, watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. All right. So not like, Oh, I hate this right in the comments. Ministry should be a joy. Ministry should be a joy. Ministry should be a joy. If it's not a joy, then you're in the wrong field. And I understand sometimes it has it has its hard times, but you should there, there should be a supernatural joy that comes on you when you when you're doing what God has called you to do. It's called grace. Remember we talked about multifaceted grace. In the uh, and my wife is a multifaceted grace, but in in the sense of our gifts and that God graces us in our gifts. This is in yesterday's stream, chapter four, First Peter four. It talks about multifaceted grace. So there's a grace that comes on ministry and pastoring and things like that. That it will become a joy, even though sometimes it's hard. Just like it's hard, any job's hard. There's no job that's just super, super easy all the, all the way through. There are hard times in every job. There are hard times in every area of life. But you're, if you're graced for it, just like a mom is great, or, you know, a mom has this supernatural grace to stay up late and be a mom with the, with the kids that, you know, a mom has a supernatural grace to, you know, they may have been so grossed out by poop and throw up and pee, but when their child does it, here comes this supernatural motherly grace on their life to clean that up. Okay. I had a supernatural fatherly grace to wipe butts that I had no intention of. You know, my wife, here's a funny story. My, we, we would uh, babysit someone's daughter at one point. And uh, my wife was like, you should practice wiping and changing a diaper. And I was like, no, I won't do that until we have our own kids. <laughs> it can't be that hard that I have to practice it. Okay. I think I'll figure it out. All right. I've wiped my own for years. Um, and it can't be too hard to strap a couple Velcro, paper Velcro straps on a diaper like thing. Okay. And un it's like underwear with straps on it. Okay. That you can throw away. I mean, it's not that hard. So guys stay strong. Don't wipe any other child's butt. Wait for your own. It's okay. You'll be all right. Um, continuing with our listen, um, watch over, not grudgingly, not willingly and not grudgingly, not for what you get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. So a supernatural grace to do it willingly, not grudgingly. And there's there's times where you want to be grudgingly and you just say, all right, I'm going to tap it in that supernatural grace and know I'm called to pastor, I'm called to minister, really called to do whatever. This could go for anything, but in the specifics here, it's talking about, um, it's talking about pastoring. So uh, in ministry, not for what you will get out of it. So some people pastor as a business, like I, they know how to make it into a, a money making machine. Um, write this in there. Ministry is not about me in the comments. Ministry is not about me. It's not about what you get out of it. You are a vessel. Again, this all ties into chapter four. You are a vessel that God can flow his grace through your gift to bless others. All right. 
and then it glorifies God. So you being a willing vessel that's not grudging about doing what they're called to do and complaining. You know, and one thing you won't catch me do um, is talk about how hard the ministry is. We miss so much time with our kids. It's rough, blah, 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 blah. Because, I mean, I really don't. I'm thank, thankful for our pastor that's been super gracious with me and my time and with my family and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I realized after reading the Bible that God is not a fan of complainers. At one point in the Old Testament, he had sent a bunch of vipers to take out some complainers out of the Israelites. So with that being said, I'm not going to even mess with that. And then if this is like the ministry of the gospel to complain about that, that's some, that's, I, I don't want any, I'm not going to complain. It ain't going to come out of my mouth. It might be a thought in my head, but it's not going to come out of my, my mouth that I hate ministry. It's, it's so hard. I can't, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm sorry. I'm not. This is a blessing for God. You know, what's really hard uh, um, is, is people that have, you know, a kid that has, or a wife, or a, a husband that has a spouse or father or mother in the military that's gone for months at a time, or some other field of work that where you're gone for months at a time. That's hard. Stay missing. You know, that's difficult. Respect to those people. But if you if you if you got a uh, if you're out there ministering and you're working a few late hours. And, and, or you're traveling, a traveling minister, you know, that is not on that same level. Don't even compare them. Don't act like it is. Anyways, let me keep going. So I was talking to pastors here, being eager to serve God, right in the comments, we should be eager to serve God. That's what I'm talking about. That joy, that supernatural joy. It's not about me. It's not about what I get out of it. It's not about, I can make this much money every week. I can get this much fame. I can use it to do other things. It's about being eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. So you got to be an example as a pastor. You got to be an example as a church leader. I'd put this for anybody in pastoral leadership or, or if you're over a department, you are not to lord it over people. Oh, I'm the media pastor. Oh, yeah. Hold on, let me, let me. I'm the parking lot pastor. You're going to do what I say. Okay. I got an orange vest and start bossing people around with your, uh, you know, your little bit of authority that you've been blessed with by the leadership that's higher than you. And then you want to lord it over people. You got to be careful who you put in authority of places because some people are very insecure and they don't know how to, um, handle that authority. I've seen this over the years. They just know you give them a, a tiny bit of authority and now they're going to go bossing everybody around. Like I remember when I went in Popeye's during COVID here in Clewiston, you know, and this is no, this is not a, this may come across prideful. If it is, then Lord forgive me. But you're a cashier at Popeye's. You are not a police officer. You're not the president of the United States. You However, though, once they put them little stickers six feet apart on the ground, you thought you were uh, the dictator of, of the United States of America. You thought you done took over and you're going to boss everybody around. So they took <laughs> and you've seen Maybe you've seen this in other places, but I remember they were so excited to say, you got to stand there. You got to stand there. You got to stand there. They took that that little bit of authority they were given to uh, boss people around now. They could not wait to be given that authority to boss people around. And you've seen this, like, I see it with little kids. It's like, you make one of the kids a line leader, and they turn into uh, Benito Mussolini. You know what I'm saying? They <laughs> they start bossing their kids around. So people can't handle that stuff. Anyways, let me get back to the Bible. Uh, don't lord it over to people assigned to your care, but lead them at, in your by your own good example. So you should be an example. So whatever you're asking somebody to do, you should be willing to do yourself. And uh, it's not wrong to delegate, but whatever you ask somebody to do, you should be willing to do it. If it came down to it, <coughs> you would do all the tasks that you're asking others to do. And when the great shepherd appears, 
uh, the great shepherd appears. That's talking about Jesus. You will receive a crown of never ending glory and honor. So it's an eternal. They were more concerned about telling you to stay in line, forget to give you food. Yeah, they forget to tell you the fact that they're out of chicken and, they, and it's Popeye's. I'll never forget. I drove up one time and it said we're out of chicken <laughs> on the drive through. I was like, all right, what we got to deal with here? We got um, popcorn shrimp and French fries and mashed potatoes. All right, we can make it make something work here. Um, when the great shepherd appears. All right, so in the end, there's a reward that, you know, if you essentially if you lord over in your authority in that moment, uh, you're you're receiving your reward now on the earth. And you're not, you know, God, God will reward that in the end. A good example, a humble leader who's eager to serve God uh, will get rewarded. But one who's grudging, one who's not, who dreads serving God, one who lords over the people, their authority, will not receive a, that crown of glory and honor in uh, the millennium. All right. In the in the afterlife. All right. So eternity. Uh, let me let me go back here. Let me pull something up. Actually, we'll look at New American Standard real quick, and then I'll read you my notes that I have. So, uh, you fellow elder or a witness of the suffer. Okay, let me see. Shepherd, I'm looking at. I'm gonna start on verse two. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, by voluntary, vo- voluntarily. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily. All right, so not like you have to do it, but I'm willing to do it according to the will of God. So if it's not God's will for you to be a pastor, don't be a pastor. Write in the comments, go with God's will. All right, how about let me switch it up. Write in the comments this. Uh, if it ain't God's will, don't do it. If it ain't God's will, don't do it. And not with greed, but with eagerness. So that's talking about, you know, there are greedy pastors. They've turned it into a business. They've turned it into, we can crank out this many services over a weekend and get this much tithe and offering. And if we keep it uh, this long, you know, we can, you know, it's just a, but, you know, it's, there's no spiritual aspect to it. It's like a business. It's like a system. It's like crank these people in, crank these people out. And that's it. And uh, crank these people in. Crank, I don't even know where that phrase came from. But like bring these people in, get the service done, move them out, move the next group in. And uh, yeah, it's like a, it becomes a business. And there's business aspects to ministry, but that's not the point. Um, nor yet as domineering over those assigned to your care. So, you know, being a micromanager. Uh, lording over your authority, doing everything. You know, it says oversight, not doing it yourself and, and just making, you know, and, and there's, and there's a, there needs to be a little bit of micromanagement to cast visions. Uh, sometimes you can tell people what you want. And uh, if you don't ever, ex- if you don't explain it clearly, you have to show it to them. Um, and that's when you, you know, but you, if you stay like that the whole time, there's no way your ministry is going to grow. It's going to be limited. You have to trust people with things. So you don't domineer over them. You oh, It's oversight. It's oversight. But you do need to check behind people. Um, if you don't check behind people, you, your ministry won't grow either. So if you just, if you leave them oversight, so that means you need to see them sometimes, okay? I just say, all right, go do your thing. And then you never check behind it. You never know what's what's going on in that ministry, and then before long, you find out there's a bunch of wrong doctrine being taught. There's some things going on that could get you in legal trouble. There's some things that um, security wise that are going on that aren't right. So you, you got to always, always um, uh, check behind people. Oversight with um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? You, you, you're like uh, you got to inspect you got to inspect what you expect, all right? So what you expect, if there's no inspection behind it, you'll never know if it's actually getting done. So it's oversight, but you do need to check behind people. All right, let me keep going. Uh, You'll receive an unfading crown of glory. All right, 
uh, providing us, uh, proving to be examples of the flock. That's what we're supposed to be, examples. So uh, let me go back. I'm going to read you a couple of notes because there's some really good notes in the study Bible here. Again, share this broadcast. All right. Um, when it talks about a fellow elder, it uses a different word. It says, sum, so you got a presbyteros, which is essentially your modern day pastors. Then you have sum presbyteros. Oh, sum presuteros. Sum presuteros. I'm really bad at reading Greek, but I'll, I'll try. A fellow elder, one on the same level with yourselves. All right, so this is going to speak, and if you're, you know, maybe if you've got a Catholic background, this might shake you up a little bit, but think about this. Just a thought. A fe- uh, it says, if Peter was the first pope, the prince of the apostles, and the head of the church, which is what, um, you know, most Catholics would believe, he certainly missed the opportunity here of making that clear to the church. So he didn't. He said, uh, I'm a fellow elder. He didn't even... Uh, He's like, he's like, I'm, I'm just an, I'm an overseer. That's essentially all he said. He said, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a bishop, pastor, overseer. That's all he said he was in that moment. He didn't make it a point to say, I'm the chief, uh, um, the first Pope, whatever you want to say there. Um, five things Peter claimed to be through this whole book. Cause we read, it's going to go back to chapter one. He claims at first to be a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Right here, a fellow elder. He said he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So he's a he's a servant, an apostle, an elder, a witness, and a partaker of the glory. Okay, so he was these five things. Um, when it talks about serving eagerly, it, said, it, it uses a Greek word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. But it li- that word literally means eagerness f- or eagerness for dishonest gain. Okay, no, that was, I'm sorry. In, not that word. The word for, uh, okay, the word, so we use, let me look on, on NLT. When it talked about um, not what you will get out of it. In that section, it uses a word about eagerness for dishonest gain, okay? And some people do that. That's uh, unfortunately, and it's turned a lot of people away from Christ. But that's not the majority, in my opinion. So you can find good pastors and good churches out there, good humble people. So don't give up on church because you had a bad experience. Just like, you know, I've had plenty of bad experiences at Wendy's, but I still like a a double cheeseburger, okay? Okay. (coughs) <coughs> I'm not going to stop eating because I had bad food experiences. So let's keep going to uh, the next scre- uh, next verse. Wow, you got that all five of those. Good job. Thanks. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. All right, so a younger person respecting the authority of the pastor, the elders of the church, and all of you dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. For God, appro- God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We're, we actually read this same verse in James last week. So God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Actually, I want you to write that in the comments. Actually, well, let's put it a little different. Pride puts you opposite of God. Pride puts you opposite of God. We see it in Lucifer when he fell. What put him, what cast him down like lightning from heaven? He got proud. He said, I want to raise myself up above God. So a young person should submit to the authority of the pastor, the elders of the church, and not say, oh, I know how to do it better. I got more energy. I got better ideas. There's a submission to authority that we need to humble ourselves, okay? Be humble. Sit down, be humble, you know? So um, <clears throat> so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. So 
Right. Put the, put this in in the comments. I'm just making. I'm just letting it. Whatever's coming out of my spirit, I'm just writing it down. So, um, humility. We're doing math problem. Humility plus patience equal honor. Humility plus patience equal honor. So if you humble yourself and you're patient, God will honor you. God will honor you. You can you can try to push your way into being uh, something a special somebody at church. This is talking in a church setting, really in any setting. But let's think about it in a church setting. You can say, "I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to be the 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 you know children's pastor or something like that." And you try to work yourself into that out of order and try to you know force your way in there, and maybe somebody bites on it, but. Um, and if it's not, you know, you should be humble and patient and let God honor you, let God raise you up. Because if you try to force your own honor in there, that's a form of pride and you can get honor from people without getting honor from God. And that's such a, uh, there's such a disparity in the level of that honor because God, his honor is does not even compare to the honor of people because people are fickle. They'll honor you one day and put you on a cross the next day. Jesus found that out. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God. At the right time, he'll lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. So whatever you're dealing with, and look, this is crazy because I know that um, this scripture is used a lot of times in context when it deals with, with anxiety and things like that, and it still applies. Um, but think about it here. It's written right after God talking about being humble in the sense of a church setting. So you're sitting here and you're stressing over the, the politics happening in your church and you're wanting to raise yourself up to a level that you should be. And, um, it says, give all that to God because he, he cares about you. He's not going to leave you out. You can write in the comments. God cares about me. God cares about me. Cast all your cares on God, for he cares about you. God cares about me. Sometimes we just need to hear it simple like that. He cares. All your worries. So, it look, all, when you look at it in the Greek, and you really studied it out, the word all actually means all. It means everything. All right? So, <laughs> um, all your cares. So, you might have cares. It's talking about a church setting here. It's talking about humility and pride in church. But look, any care that you're dealing with, God cares about you and cast it on him. Give him the anxiety. Give him the cares. But the issue is people don't address God. They only they think certain things God cares about and certain things God doesn't. So um, they won't they won't even de they won't even speak to God about this area of their life because they think it's not. It's not worth uh, God's time. God is big enough to care about every little detail in your life and every person in the world. That We are limiting God when we say, you know, I don't want to bother God with this little thing. This is not concerning him. Everything concerns him about your life. So <clears throat> let's see what it says in the, in the NASB. Humble yourself under the... Okay, wait, oh, we were on verse 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to you elders, to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself in humility towards one another. So that means you have to write this in the comment. Put on humility. Put on put on humility. So you it, it clothes you, it covers you. All right. It's something you decide to put on. If it says clothe yourself, it means I'm like, all right, I wanna say something prideful, but I say, all right, let me pick up this humility and put it on. Clothe myself in humility toward one another because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Quickest way to switch sides and fight against God is get proud. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all anxiety on him because he cares about you. If you're watching today, hot topic, anxiety. I had, um, we had a, um, uh, a really strong move of the spirit at youth this past Wednesday. It was we were praying for kids, laying hands on them, uh, and then at the end, I you know I did. We were going a little long, so I said, "All right, it's eight thirty. I'll dismiss everybody. If anybody needs prayer, let me pray for you." 
And we prayed for, I, there were four kids that came up for prayer specifically. And basically every single one of them came to me about anxiety. So every single one of them, came, they were anxious about something. One of them was actually having anxiety attacks. So they were just anxious. They were worried. And, and this is a big thing that's weighing on people of all ages, anxiety, concern about the future, fear about the future, but God cares about those things. So we got to go to God about anxiety. That means a couple things. I go to him in prayer. I ask him for help. I tell, you know, for wisdom. The Bible says you ask for wisdom. And with, if you ask with no doubting in your heart, then he'll give it to you freely. That's in James. We just read that James chapter one. But also go to the word. This is God's word. Find out what he says about you. And if you, if you find out what he says about you, that it, it, if you truly believe it and you walk it out, then that'll get rid of your anxiety. Listening to Holy Ghost preaching, listening to good teaching, that'll help your anxiety. That'll give you peace. Uh, but you've got to go to God about your anxiety. So let me, let me read a couple of notes here. Um, Okay, actually, there's no notes on that. So we'll keep going. <laughs> no notes on that verse there. A couple of different commands. Let's go back to the NLT. Uh, let me go over here. Uh, let's see, verse eight, we're starting on. Stay alert. Or in most translations, it'll tell you, and just in the New American Standard, I think it says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. For your adversary, the devil, prowls, al prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So resist him, stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are, around, who are in the world. All right, so let's read it again in NLT. It says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Put in the comments, like, uh, uh, do it like this. Like don't mean he is. Li <laughs> like doesn't mean he is. I don't know if that makes sense. I'll explain it in a minute. Like doesn't mean he is. Stand firm against him be strong in your faith remember that your family of believers remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are so if he if he prowls around like a roaring lion that doesn't mean he is an a roaring lion so he's like a lion looking for someone to devour most translations say whom he may devour in uh NASB says uh seeking someone to devour but what it's telling you is if you stay alert if you stay sober if you're paying attention to what's going on and you're not opening yourself up opening yourself up from attacks from the the great enemy satan he won't devour you okay you got to stand firm against him that means i don't shake on my faith i don't go into fear mode i don't go into uh flesh mode i don't go into um doing things that God doesn't tell me to do. I stand firm in the truth against him and be strong in your faith. So where there's a strong faith, if there's a strong faith, that means there can be a weak faith. As we can see through the gospels, Jesus oftentimes said, O ye of little faith. I've never seen such great faith. Oh, he said faithless. People had no faith. So there's a measure, people's faith uh, that they're using can be measured. Is it great? Is it little? Is it none? Um, it, it can be strong apparently. So be strong. Remember there's all the believers across the world are going through the same kind of, uh, suffering and persecution that you are for being a Christian. Now we know in some places it's a little harder than it is in America, but there's a level of persecution in every area of the world for Christian Christianity. Thank God we're where we are where we are. If you're watching, I think everybody watching is probably from the United States. Um, 
And it's a blessing to be here. Never take that for granted because you can't you can't even go to Canada and preach the full gospel without persecution. And that's just right up the road. So everybody thinks Canada is uh is uh you know America 2.0, but it's not. <laughs> so we gotta stay alert. We gotta be sober. Literally means I read you a couple notes here. Literally means be sober. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5. We're on verse 8. The word ne nepho, nepho, means sober. And then it says the next word, Greg Gregorio, which means to be awake. Trans Here's the literal translations, in, in, or the way it's, it's translated in other scriptures. Vigilant, all right? You're paying attention. You're watchful. You're not just going through life without any attention to what's happening on uh, happening in your life. You're just going by whatever your, wherever your flesh leads you. You know, if you're in prayer and fasting right now, you know, you're putting your flesh under and your spirit should be, you should feel like your spirits rising up to a higher level. And as you put your flesh under, you're more alert spiritually. And you should be that way. Um, we should oft we should be that way at all times. It's not just during prayer and fasting, but to, to be led by the flesh and led only by logic instead of godly wisdom and the Holy Spirit, then you will, you'll, um, you'll, you'll just be like everybody else. You'll be, you'll be sleeping through life. You have to be awake to what's really going on. You know, they call it being woke. All right. We're actually right in the comments. Stay woke parentheses in the spirit. Stay woke parentheses in the spirit. Vigilant, wake, watchful, um, it's used 19 times, this same word. Jesus used it often. Uh, Paul used it in his letters. It's used by Luke in Acts. Never be off your guard. Write in the comments, I can't afford to be off my guard. I can't afford to be off my guard. We think about how quickly the return of the Lord is coming. We can't afford to be off off guard. We have to be ready. We have to be watchful. Every opportunity that the, that the enemy would take against us, every opportunity <coughs> that we have to share the gospel, to pray for people, to be a light, we cannot be off our guard. Be ready every moment to resist the devil. We've got to resist. And then it says, uh, for a, that word adversary, when it says our enemy, our adversary, the devil, it means an opponent in a legal suit, properly the defendant, but also the plaintiff or the one who brings the suit. Think about this. The devil is an accuser. He's like trying to get you to believe what he's accusing. He's nothing but a liar, though. So whatever he says, if you have no legal answer through the word that's that should be in your heart and in your spirit, if you have no legal response to the devil, he's going to win the battle. So that's what it's saying. It's literally saying it's like a lawsuit. It's like he's accusing you. That's why maybe you've heard him be called the accuser of the brethren. He's accusing you of something, calling you out on something, tempting you, just like he did in the beginning with Adam and Eve. He told them, uh, did God really mean that about the tree? You should just try that apple, see what it tastes like, you know? And then look, look what happened after that. God means what he says. So take what he says and anytime you're accused by the enemy or some kind of thought in your mind that is opposing the word, say, nope, my legal, I know my legal rights and my constitution, my covenant says that that is not correct. So I'm going to go with what the constitution would say. Hey, hey, Mindy, hope you're doing good. All right. So let's keep going. It says when it when it says devour there, it talks about being swallowed up. So it even it even could be used as drowning. Swallowed up. It is not everyone that Satan can gulp down. Those who obey the commands of verse five, which says being uh getting the uh being humble and and submitted to authority of God, because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble cannot be swallowed up by him. So if you humble yourself before the Lord, do what he says, 
you're not going to be um you're not going to be uh devoured by the enemy so let's keep going <clears throat> it says resist when it says resist him stay strong in the faith this method of satanic defeat is open to every child of god all right, this is, this is available to every child of God, not just pastors, not just super Christians, but anyone who's a Christian has this power. And then when it talks about the sufferings here, this refers to persecutions of Christians in all the world, not to diseases. Again, I've talked about this before. These sufferings is talking about persecution. Write it in the comments one more time. Sufferings equal persecution. And all the other sufferings, other than satanic opposition, stem from persecution and not from disease. People read the sufferings of the scripture and, and, you know, over the years, you know, maybe that suffering word meant a little different uh, in old English and like your King James and your new King James, but that's not the best way to translate it. Those sufferings are talking about as what we would know as a persecution and not saying that God, you cannot say God's put diseases on you. That would contradict all scripture. Uh, that would tell you the character of God. So the words of sufferings means the same as the sufferings of Christ. Did Christ suffer from disease? Write in the comments, Christ never suffered from disease. Christ never suffered from disease. So if we share in the sufferings of Christ, then how could suffering be disease? How could suffering be God putting cancer on you to teach you a lesson? That's not what the Bible says. A little more coffee in the system here while you ponder that. Think about what Christ suffered. Persecution, opposition, people talking bad about him, people uh, um, that were once close to him turning on him. You got your Judases. You got your people that celebrated him when he came through um, on the donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, we praise you. Same people had him on the cross within a week. So that's the sufferings. And you got to be willing to share those. People are going to turn your back, turn their back on you. People are going to want to talk bad about you behind your back. People are going to want to falsely accuse you. People are going to want to hold your past against you. People are going to want to doubt you. They doubted Jesus. Isn't he Joseph's son? Isn't he just from Nazareth? How could, he, how could this be he, him being the Messiah? This is, no, I don't believe it. People and, and, you know, so think about that when it says we share in the sufferings of Christ, that, that should be, that should end all the bad doctrine that says, uh, disease or physical harm came from God. And that's part of the sufferings of Christ. And we need to endure. That's not what that's talking about. So, I mean, physical harm could come from, you know, if you're being severely persecuted in a, um, in a foreign country where they, would beat you for being a Christian, then yeah. Again, thank God we live in America. Most of y'all wouldn't make heaven. No, let me stop. You know, we got to get that fire back. You know, I remember they would tell you stuff like in Sunday school, in, in a, um, at a Baptist Christian school, they would say stuff like, are you willing to get beat for the gospel? Are you willing to be persecuted for the gospel are you willing to um you know go to jail for the gospel would you if they came to you and put a gun to your head remember i grew up during when columbine happened they put a gun to your head and said do you believe in jesus what would you say and i remember they were telling us this at like seven eight years old you know and now you think about most Christians, they would be like, well, I think God would understand. So I'll just say, I don't believe so I can live. It'll be better that I live. They would justify it somehow in their head. Same way they justify sinful and fleshly actions now. But let's keep going. So the persecution is talking about the same sufferings of Jesus. Now let's go to verse 10. I got to finish up. Verse 10, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So if you have suffered for a little while, he will restore. So look, there's the promise at the end of the suffering. It's not just I leave you in the suffering. He'll restore, support, and strengthen you. Write in the comments, he will restore, support, and strengthen me. He will restore, support, and strengthen me. 
and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. You know what he's, you know what's going on right there in verse 11? He preached himself happy while he was writing the letter and he had to, he had to write that in there. That's why pastors make noise when they're preaching. Some people are like, I don't like all the yelling. I don't like all the ha, 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 glory. Ha, 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 ha. Well, people just get happy. It's okay. They get under the anointing and they get happy. Sometimes it happens. So let's check this out. Ooh, messed my thing up. All right. Let's see what it says in New American Standard. It says, if you suffered, after you suffered a little while, again, persecution, God of, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Wow, that's strong too. Perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You'll come out better on the other side. Perfect. He'll confirm that what you believe is legit to others and to you in your own spirit. He'll strengthen you. When you feel weak, you keep pushing through, you'll get a supernatural strength. If you give up, you won't get that. But you keep pushing through the persecution and he'll establish you. He'll set you on a foundation. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's look at this. A couple notes and then we're almost done here. Um, four blessings of suffering persecutions, perfection, which that's talked about in, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Establishment in the faith. Again, that's, re, that's referred to in Romans. Spiritual strength, stenos. I don't know if I'm saying that right. That's the Greek word. To bind together and strengthen so there will be no danger of warping, splitting, or falling apart. And it's only used in that one verse there. That's, that's uh, interesting. Setting or grounding one in the faith. A good, lay a good foundation. He'll lay a, fain, a foundation for you. And then we just have basically his, uh, his greeting in the end of the chapter. Through Sylvanus, our, former, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly. Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. He's like, all right, what I said is legit. Stand firm in what I said. <clears throat> she who was in Babylon, chosen together with you. So this was actually written from Babylon, AD 60. Sends you greetings and so does my son Mark. Okay, who are these people? We'll find out in a second. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you. All who are in Christ. I'll never forget. <clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't tell this story. No, I'm not going to tell the story. All right. Uh, the same as Silas. Okay, so 12. So Silvanus was Silas. Okay, you've heard of Paul and Silas. Same dude. All right. Different name. Uh... Yeah, look, it says in NLT, I have written to you and sent a short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I, who I commend to you as a faithful brother. He probably brought the letter to him. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Write in the comments, stand firm in God's grace. <coughs> that means he... You know what he's graced you to do. You just stick with it and you go with it with everything you got. All right, stand firm in his grace. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings. So there's a couple churches there. So does my son Mark greet each other with a kiss of love. Peace be with you all who are in Christ Jesus. All right. This refers to the city of Babylon on the Euphrates River. A couple notes here. The only literal Babylon mentioned in scripture. It is a historical fact that Babylon was still in existence at the time and that there were many Jews there. Josephus writes of Babylon about the same time in his book of antiquities, if you've ever read that. Um, this is John Mark. His son he's talking about here is, uh, he's talking about like a son in the faith, all right? Not a physical son. All right, he's not the actual son of Peter. So who's John Mark? John Mark, same guy that wrote the book of Mark, also known as John Mark. So um, Mark was Peter's son in the faith. So that means essentially Mark looked up to Peter for spiritual authority and leadership. 
and uh, he submitted under Peter's uh, direction as a spiritual leader, okay? And he had two other sons in the faith. For, uh, he had Timothy. We know, you. most of you guys know about Timothy. And then you have uh, Titus. And Titus was um, uh, another pastor that, maybe we'll read that book of Titus. This has got one chapter, so. Um, and then here's, here's the biggest thing you need to know. If you're going to take the Bible literally, um, it says, greet one another with a kiss of love. So here's the note that I'm going to stick with from this Dake study Bible, because I don't want to be kissing nobody except for my wife and definitely no men. This was an Eastern greeting, not necessarily a Christian one. So it's, he's saying it. there was just a, 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 a customary standard. Okay. And I know some of y'all look, <coughs> you come from, you know, Hispanic culture. Sometimes they be kissing on the cheek too. You know, kissing, uh, the old ladies be kissing everybody on the cheek, you know. And and you're like, I don't know um, where you've been and I really don't want your, your cheap lipstick on the side of my face. You know what I'm saying? Like stuff like that. But anyways, um, I don't want to go on a rant about that. I remember one time I was in a service and the pastor said, turn to somebody. He quoted this scripture and said, turn to somebody and give them a kiss. Now I respect this man of God so much that I literally did it. And I was like, and I regret that so bad. <laughs> oh, what a day. It was a great service, but that sure made me uncomfortable the rest of the day. I had, I feel like I had to repent for, um, doing that. Um, so, uh, with that being said, hopefully y'all learned something from first Peter. We'll start second Peter on Monday at 9 PM. Again, you can listen to all these audio podcasts on Spotify and I will update the rest of those, um, sometime before Monday <coughs> there. Uh, I think I've got most of them on there. Um, but the ones from this week, I don't know, think I have them all on there. So, but we'll get them on there and, um, Yeah. Finish 1 Peter today. We'll start 2 Peter on Monday. Uh, go ahead and read it if you want. God bless y'all. Love y'all. Thanks for everybody that tuned in. And share this broadcast if you know somebody that needs it. Have an awesome day.